Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Drake. I'm a partner and advisor with Fairport and Luma Wealth. We do hope you and your families are healthy, happy, and finding safe ways to enjoy this beautiful summer. Welcome to our second virtual investment town hall. Based on the feedback we received from our inaugural event, we plan to hold these webinars on a quarterly basis going forward. We asked for your questions in advance and John Silvis and his investment team have prepared a presentation addressing those questions as well as other topics top of mind with our clients. Here's our agenda. We're gonna talk about what happened, where we are now in regards to policy, markets, and portfolios, the presidential election, and finally, what we're watching on a day-to-day -day basis. From a housekeeping perspective, everyone on this call is muted, except for John and I, of course, and your cameras are disabled. We've incorporated some polls into the slides to hear from you and keep it interactive. To make sure that you receive those polls, it helps to have your screen, your window on full screen. If you have additional questions throughout the presentation, you can type them into the question section of your toolbar and we'll answer as many as we can, time permitting. So with that, I'll turn it over to John, our Chief Investment Officer. Thanks, Emily, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm assuming everybody can see my screen. So uh, yeah, so Emily said, we're gonna go through a process. The first one is, you know, what happened? I guess I could really say, uh, you know, what didn't happen <clears throat> over the quarter. It's been quite an eventful time, but uh, a couple things. First, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. As Emily mentioned, I appreciate it. I know everybody's taking time out of their uh, busy summer days, and uh, I very much appreciate it. Uh, other thing I'd like to mention is, as Emily said, you know, I, I want to thank everybody here in the Fairport team. It, it takes quite the uh, amount of people to get these things working, especially my investment team, uh, which works on it with me, but then marketing and everyone else. And we have a a saying here, team over self at Fairport, and I would say this is definitely a great example of that. So much appreciated to everybody at the Fairport team. Um, but you know, lots happened here in the second quarter. Uh, we're actually just a couple of days into the third quarter, but I thought I'd go over a couple. I mean, personally, um, we have one more high school graduate in the uh, Silvis household. So that's uh, for anybody out there keeping score, that's two out of three. We have one more to go. Um, I'm calling from, I'm doing this from my office. So I'm back downtown two days a week. So we are making some progress in that. So we are, uh, things have been changing. So you know, I thought um, we'll just go from there. And so let's get started. Uh, get a lot of questions about the dip, the difference between the markets and the economy over the last few months. And I know it's, it's difficult to understand because you on one hand see headlines from um, economic numbers and, and they've just been pretty horrible over the second quarter, especially versus last year. And then you see the markets uh, moving up or recovering. So I'm going to cover a couple of those things, but really, is you know, as it says, it's all how uh, you know how you look at it. Uh, if I rotate this clockwise, it, you know, the economy would look horrible if you keep it where it is. The markets look like uh, people are happy the way things are going. But we're going to cover both those issues today. I know it's been a, a question we got from clients a lot, and I know a couple of people emailed uh, variations of that question as well. So we'll cover that. But real quick, uh, just some housekeeping here. So first quarter of 2020. We started off pretty well. Uh, markets were reaching new highs in February a couple times during the year. And then as the uh, pandemic picked up, we saw the markets react what they thought was an oncoming recession, which they actually got right. So the first quarter uh, officially started a recession in uh, late February. And as you can see there on the screen, in the upper right box there, it says quarter over quarter, that's an annualized basis. The GDP growth was down 5% for, uh, for the quarter. And but uh, year over year, still was basically flat at 0.3 percent. So, you know, that's kind of backward looking at this point, but just to kind of set the stage where we're at. Second quarter, uh, unfortunately, you know, what, what do we expect in the second quarter? Uh, how far is it going to fall is really the question. Uh, all I will say, second quarter hopefully will be the worst quarter in our lifetime. Uh, this is a, a chart from GDP Now, which is run by the Atlanta Federal Reserve. They are currently, if you can see my cursor on the screen, predicting this econometric model that, that takes a real-time economic data. So they're predicting somewhere around 35% decline on an annualized basis in the second quarter. Um, consensus of right 
the consensus of blue chip economists are right about the same way. So it's, it's going to be somewhere between 30 and probably 40 percent decline in GDP growth. Uh, hopefully we'll never see that again. It's, I just think it's going to be awful and you got to chalk up for that. Um, you know, really, that's a result of what most people would call, you know, forced shutdown of the economy. So, uh, but I think the good news is we did see the the recession most likely end in late April, maybe early May. Uh, we'll get official numbers on that as we get throughout the year. But most economists that we view and watch think that, you know, we've shifted from what is uh, a recession to the re to the recovery or expansion. So, uh, again, we get a lot of questions on you know, how do these two things um, reconcile? So the two, two headlines on the same day, this is June June 8th, uh, both were taken from CNBC, believe it or not. So the top one, U.S. enters a recession in February, according to the official economic arbitrator, which is the NBER, which is the National Bureau of Economic Research. And then on the bottom, you see the S&P erases its loss for the year, the stocks rally on the uh, reopening optimism. And we actually saw that again yesterday, the markets, uh, Again, push that 3,200 on the S&P, 3,230 to be exact, which is uh, making it even for the year. We, we didn't hold it, and I think we'll see that a couple times. That's not uncommon to kind of test those um, resistance levels. Um, so anyway, a, a couple of things on that. One, you know, the economy is backward looking. So when you get numbers, they're always looking at what happened the last month or the last quarter. And over the last few few uh, months, going back to February, the economic numbers look bad. So we're getting a a, a cornucopia of bad news from an economic standpoint, at least the historical stuff, first quarter or second quarter. But the economy or the markets really are affordable mechanisms. So they look at, they're looking at now at the recovery. So markets tend to bottom in anticipation of a recession. They tend to, um, or I'm sorry, they tend to go down in anticipation of a recession. They tend to bottom in a recession. They tend to bounce and actually, um, start to, to climb near the end of recessions. And although we've seen all this kind of condensed in a very short time frame, um, assuming a recession started in February and ended in called late April, early May, it still followed that pattern. Markets peaked in early February. We had a pretty big decline going into end of February, early March, which was anticipation of the re recession, which we actually call. And then from that bottom called uh, uh, March 23rd, into currently now we've seen a, a, the markets recover in anticipation of what they think is going to be the expansion, which I think now we are in. So it does hold the pattern. It seems a little hard. You know, the good the good news is most economic expansions last about eight years. Everything's a little different when you put it in the backdrop of a pandemic. So I'm not sure that will hold. But uh, long term averages uh, look for expansions to be about eight years on average, and I think we're we're entering a new one. So that's a good thing. Um, so return for the second quarter, we're actually very good. Um, coming off, again, what was the low in, in early March, but uh, best quarter we've seen in the S&P, uh, I'll see if I can get it right there, uh, since 1998. Uh, small caps are actually the best performing asset class in the uh, second quarter. And again, that follows historical patterns of uh, coming off a low, uh, especially during a recession, um, market lows. Small caps tend to outperform, and in, in that pattern has been holding so far through the end of June. Uh, still negative for the year. Uh, S&P finished a quarter down about 3%, but was positive a little under 8% for the year. Um, international, emerging mar mer international emerging markets still tend to trail the, the large cap stocks. U.S. large cap domestic stocks, and we'll talk about those a little bit in a minute, uh, continue to lead um, over the last few, few quarters. Uh, again, here, here's a snapshot from CNBC. I spend way too much of my, my time in my uh, bedroom office watching CNBC, so I catch these every once in a while. But here, uh, best core in the Dow since 1987, best core in the S&P since 1998. So all, all historical, it's been a historical quarter for all the averages in the NASDAQ uh, since 2001, um, all in the backdrop of a recession or in a quarter of a re during a recession. Um, you know, as far as you know, leadership, and we we will talk a little bit about this is when we relate to our portfolios as well. But uh, and I do get a couple of questions on on this as well. Um, is there a perception that there's a small group of tech stocks leading the advance, and, and that's the only thing that's really moving the markets? And, and that's I'd say that's partially correct. But as you can see in that top chart, 
uh, technology, you know, from the from the peak to the trough. So ba basically, February to the March 23rd low, tech did do the best. I mean, again, best meaning was only down 30 or 29 percent versus a little little less than 34. And then Russell 1000 growth or basic growth stocks uh, did better. But I think that's been consistent from the trough as well. So if you could look at the bottom chart uh, from the bottom in March 23rd through the end of the quarter. Um, Leadership's been pretty consistent. It's been both in technology, um, a couple of the ones to a lesser extent, but those are the two the ones that we've seen lead. So I think uh, I'm going to pause there. Um, I think I'm supposed to kick it back to Emily. Is that correct, Emily? That is correct. I'm just checking to see if we have any questions. Um, if not, I'll let you continue, John. It so looks I get like a question all the time. If you want me to put it out there, I will. Okay. So the question I get from clients, and they know that I'm a big football fan, is are we going to have college football this year? Um, not related to the markets, but I think it's an important question to ask. So anyway, uh, if you'd asked me two weeks ago, I'd have said about 60% chance. I think it's about a 40% chance of probably fading fast. Um, I have a, we have a client who is a big Auburn Tigers fan, and we talk about it all the time, so uh, we'll see how that works out. But anyway, go ahead. John, there aren't any questions. I'll let you continue. All right. Enough. So, uh, so, so where are we now? Um, we're going to go through a bunch of slides here. And again, if you have a question, go ahead and uh, fill it out in the comment box. But, you know, as far as the economy goes, um, you know, I think as of now, and, and this is a picture of uh, Chairman Powell, who's on the left there, and uh, Secretary Mnuchin on the on the right. And for anybody who grew up watching uh, Saturday morning cartoons, you'll know who the Wonder Twins are. But um, I think, you know, fiscal monetary policy have the upper hand. Um, I think Federal Reserve Chairman Powell has, has made the statement uh, a couple times in a, in a, about um, uh, keeping rates low for a long period of time. It sounds kind of familiar. I think we've heard that before. And I think Congress has done their part, especially in an election year, to try to help stimulate the economy or at least uh, keep it propped up. And I think that's going to continue. There's a lot of talk in Washington, and we get a lot of research from a policy group from uh, strategist research that you know they think there's going to be one more fiscal package before the election most likely after congress uh, gets back from recess which i think is in early august and it's probably going to be somewhere about 1.5 trillion you know what's in it still up in the air there's a lot of uh, discussion on the on the ppp program extending the unemployment um added benefit so we'll see but i do think you know we're going to see more stimulus uh, out there and um and hopefully the wonder twins can, uh, can get it right so uh we're gonna see rates lower for longer and i, I say it sounds familiar because i think we saw that coming out of the 08 crisis uh, 08 09 financial crisis and i think we're gonna continue to see that to, uh, today chairman powell mentioned in one of his i think one of his um testimonies to congress that and, and i hope i get this right he's not even thinking about thinking about raising rates, which means we're going to see rates stay very low for a long period of time. And you can see in this chart, um, the the uh, squiggly line here, if I can find it, yeah, is the 10-year treasury. And really, if, um, if you go back to uh, earlier this year, we saw a pretty big drop in treasuries. We're sitting around 60 basis points in the 10-year treasury. But these are forecasts the market assumes where rates will, uh, the Fed funds will be over the next couple of years. So uh, basically, for 2021 and even into 2022, they think rates will stay low. I know Federal Reserve Chairman has mentioned that he thinks rates will stay low until at least the end of 2021. So um, the markets think it's a little longer than that. Uh, balance sheets continue to expand. Um, I think you know they're going to show support if necessary. And, and uh, I don't think the markets are anticipating any type of rate movement over the next few years. So that's usually a pretty good backdrop for equities. Uh, I know I get again get a lot of questions from clients about you know what does this do for the deficits, uh, deficit spending, all great questions. I think they're all very big concern. I think at the end of the day, the markets are going to decide when it's too much and how much debt is too much. If you can float a 10-year Treasury at 60 basis points in the and it's oversubscribed, the markets are telling you they're not that concerned. I think if we see a point in time where we try to sell, we try to sell debt or a, a bond, new bonds, and the so-called bond vigilantes decide the rates aren't high enough, and they and they sit out the auction, and we have to raise rates, then you start it becomes a concern. Um, uh, CPI or, or consumer price index or 
basically a measurement of inflation came out today and it was I think 1.2%. So there really is no inflationary uh, pressures out there as we see it today. So, uh, you know, if, if there's a silver lining in all the lower interest rates, it's mortgage, mortgage rates continue to fall. And I think that's, you know, that's been great for the housing market. Um, I think, uh, as you can see, 30 year treasuries at three point, basically 3.2% as of last week is historically pretty low. Uh, and again, if it hasn't refinanced, probably will, if it makes sense. And I think we'll see that going uh, further. And I think eventually, the, uh, as we mentioned last time, the millennials will, will move to the suburbs and there'll be more demand for housing. I know housing in Strongsville, Ohio, where I live, has been pretty robust. So, um, uh, so other thing you hear about, you know, and we talked a little about this last time, is it a W, is it a V, is it a U, shape recovery? I think I used uh, the Nike swoosh as one of the examples. I've heard square, which I'm not even sure what that is. So there's there's a lot out there. I think, you know, so far the numbers coming off the bottom, and, I, and I'll throw a couple of those out. The jobs number, which was about 4.8 million in June, was better than expected. The uh, price, the PMIs or uh, purchasing manufacturer index numbers have been better than expected. Unemployment claims continue to go down. Unemployment rate dropped to 11.1%, which seems historically bad, but a 16% is, is uh, again, better than expected. So the, the data has definitely been surprising us on uh, 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 the upside. So, you know, will we see this continuation? Um, I don't know. So move my screen here for a second. So uh, next one you know we see is the consumer price index or purchasing manufacturers index, which I mentioned earlier. History would tell you if it's above 50, we're in expansion territory. Um, look at last quarter as uh, calculated by Evercore I saw it at 55.8. So it's a pretty big bounce back, uh, much quicker than we saw in the financial crisis. A little different. One was uh, driven by a policy, and one was driven by a decision to. Uh, shut the economy down so i think we'll see i'm probably not in the v-shaped camp although i think it's probably better than i would have been, uh, guessed uh, a few a few weeks ago now you know, if we go through a second shutdown here because of the um spike in in cases and you know that remains to be seen we'll have to reevaluate that going forward but we're definitely above that uh, that that red red line which represents it. Uh, other one out there that we look at pretty closely, this is, this is a new one. Uh, if you'd asked me a year ago, I wouldn't know what this meant, but, uh, you know, the Apple U.S. Mobility Index, which we've been watching pretty closely because it, it measures people's movement, so, you know, throughout about getting uh, directions or getting a map to go places. It, 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 does, it does track you. If you're not sure, yes, Apple does track you. Uh, and so far, you know, we've, we made a pretty big move off the bottom. Um, this is basically during the shutdown, so obviously we saw demand drop uh, fairly quickly, and then we've seen it recover as soon as the opening. Now, we have a little blip here. I mean, we're well above where we're in pre-pandemic levels, so I'm not too concerned, but we'll see how that goes going forward. But people are out and about. Um, it is summertime, and people are taking vacations, so uh, that's a good thing for the economy. Um, hey, John, can, uh, I, can, I pause, yeah. can I pause yeah, you sure. just for a minute? Mm -hmm. for, we've got a couple questions, but I think we have a poll to go first from Annika. Do you want to put it up, yeah. Annika? So have you, and I can't see the poll, so have you been traveling by any of the uh, of um, car, airplane, or train? We'll give people a minute to reply. I can't see it either, so. <laughs> John, while, while they are replying, I have a question um, from one of our uh, attendees. How sure, many trillions? Sure. How many trillions of dollars in debt have been added to the Fed's balance sheet, and what are the long-term Im implications associated with that? Uh, so I don't have an exact number, but I think the balance sheet was it was be well below it was well below four trillion when we started this. I want to say it was closer to three. But uh, I believe we're above six, if I'm not mistaken, six and a half. So we've definitely added to the balance sheet. And I think we'll be adding more to it. Um, you know, as far as, again, what effects that has, I guess it, it remains to be seen at this point. Um, I think as long as the debt is 
at a low interest rate and it's manageable. Um, and from the treasury standpoint or the fiscal standpoint, that's okay. I think from the uh, Federal Reserve standpoint, you know, that they are committed to doing whatever it takes and, and uh, managing the, the balance sheet accordingly. So, so far, I, I don't think there's been any negative effects to it. Um, but, you know, time will tell on that one. So another question, John, um, is, uh, is this a case where bad news is being cheered by Wall Street because they are anticipating more fiscal stimulus from Washington or actions by the Fed to prop things up? Um, I don't know if they're cheering bad news, so to speak. Uh, I think there is an anticipation, there's an, I don't know if you want to call it expectation, I guess, from Wall Street that, um, you know, and, and by the Fed chairman's own words, you know, they're going to do what it takes to help um, uh, maintain the, or help prop up the economy. I think, you know, there is some expectations built into to Wall Street that, you know, yes, there's going to be more stimulus coming. And I think they see that more of a bridge till we get back to what is, and I hate to say the word normal, because I don't know what normal is anymore, but if, so whatever that new normal would be, and that's getting down below 10% unemployment, getting GDP, you know, positive growth. And I think we'll see positive growth in the third quarter, um, back to what I think is potential GDP growth, which is somewhere around two, two and a half percent. So, you know, I think there's some of that built in. Um, I don't know, you know, if, I don't know if it's bad news. I think most of the you know, I don't know if it was Fred, uh, Chairman Greenspan that used to talk about green shoots or the second derivative, which is less bad. I think we're kind of cheering that the, the data has been less bad before. And um, you know, we could argue we could argue semantics on if it's good or bad, but I think the the markets are at this point still anticipating more uh, stimulus. And as I mentioned before, there's a good likelihood that we'll see about probably a trillion dollars or one and a half trillion dollar. Um, and we call it the CARES package last time. I don't know if we're going to put a different name to it, but something similar to that. So, uh, I think if that didn't come to fruition, the market would see that negative. So I, I don't. you didn't see the poll results, but I think about 99% um, of the results were people drove instead of taking a train or a plane, which is no surprise. I do have one more question. Um, uh, for how long? Will the rest of the world allow the U.S. to keep printing money instead of improving the fundamentals? Are the days of the dollar as the benchmark currency numbered? If so, what are the ramifications? Should we consider more assets invested outside the U.S.? So the second question is: the dollar as the uh, reserve currency stays numbered? I don't think it is. If it is, you know, I, I, I would ask, you know what's what's the next reserve currency i don't think it's the euro i don't think it's the chinese uh yuan i definitely don't think it's bitcoin so i don't think i guess the quick answer is no i don't think that's that's going to be the case i think the u.s dollar is still the reserve currency going forward i mean you know how long that is i don't know but i don't see it in the foreseeable future uh the first question i think was on, on uh printing money or printing debt is that what the question was right um, you know, yes. how much, how long will the, well, you know, so how long will the rest of the world allow us to print money? Well, you know, I guess the question is whenever they quit buying the debt. And so far it's been oversubscribed every time we do it. You look at China, Japan, I mean, most of those people hold a lot of our debt. They don't hold it because they're trying to be nice. They hold it because it's the most stable um, uh, security out there. So until that changes, uh, or until they demand, you know, higher yields. I think it's the status quo. I mean, it's it's not a great answer. I get that, and there is a lot of debt out there, and people. There's a lot of people that are concerned by it, and I, I understand that point. But, um, you know, that I could have said the same thing five years ago, and same boat. And, and as far as I know, China will squat once in a while. They're still buying our debt, as is Japan and most other industrialized countries. We have other questions, but I'm gonna I'm gonna delay them because they are related to the election, and we'll okay. wait till we get to that part. So, All right, fair ahead. enough. So I'm gonna I'm gonna continue here. I think we have a pause coming up here in a minute. But so um, we're talking about the economy, and you know if there's if there's anything that's still concerning, and I don't want to paint a, a totally rosy picture because I think there are some issues out there, and we're we're seeing them on a daily basis. Is you know layoffs continue to climb, 
Um, you know, could it be peaking? I think that's, if there's a silver lining, it, it, it might likely be peaking. If you look at these, I don't know what we call it, purplish uh, shaded areas, that's when we had US recessions. This is ISI's best guess on when we started and stopped the recession. As you can see, uh, severity was pretty was pretty bad, but the, the time length wasn't as bad. So, but normally you see unemployment layoffs pretty much uh, coincide with the end of recession. So uh, we'll get another a number here pretty soon, and maybe that's the case, uh, you know, in July as well. But that's obviously a concern. Um, we'll see as we go forward. Um, but you know, again, uh, and this will kind of tie into elections too. Job losses and uh, recessions are killer for um, uh, incumbent three elections. But as as uh, it could take likely several years to recover all the jobs we lost. If you go back to the most recent example, which was the great. Uh, the Great Recession or the, or the financial crisis, we lost, um, I'm going to say somewhere around 10 million jobs from uh, the peak there to the trough. It took us 76 months to recover. Now, so far, we've lost about 20, uh, 22 million jobs, I guess you could call that. We've recovered some of them. It seems like we're on a quicker path than we were here. Um, we'll see how long that takes. But again, it could take several years um, to cover those job losses. So that's a concern. Um, people that don't have a job tend not to spend, and uh, we have a consumer-driven economy. So, but overall, I think there are more positives and negatives. This is a, a write-up from Everport ISI, uh, just kind of uh, putting them in columns. You know, on the positive side, as I mentioned earlier, housing is doing well, and housing prices have held up. Their trucker survey, which they do on a weekly basis on their uh, company surveys, uh, the, the trucker survey is the one that's most closely tied to GDP growth and it continues to climb, which means the economy is most likely recovering. Uh, trucks, you know, truck companies tend to have positive uh, survey responses when they have trucks on the road and they, they're putting trucks back on the road. Uh, continuing unemployment claims continue to drop. We've seen 12 weeks in a row. Credit spreads, although they blew out a little bit early on, have started to tighten back up. And, and China, uh, the survey with China, basically that means that the Chinese economy if it's a road map for us or not, has has recovered fairly quickly from from their uh, their shutdown. Um, I guess a few months before ours, probably December January. Um, so I'm going to shift to the markets and talk a little about valuations. Well, I, I think at the end of the day, a, a couple thoughts, and if there's big themes on on where we think the markets are today and where we think they're going to move over the next few months, I think one is volatility will continue. Um, we've seen that over the last few days. Uh, volatility has volatility has picked up. Um, we're stuck in that 2,900 to 3,200 range on the S&P. We, we got close to 32 yesterday, which is probably the high end of the range. Came off of it pretty quickly. I think we're going to move around in there for a while. Eventually, the market will break one way or the other. My guess, I think it's going to break higher, not lower. So we continue to think markets will improve. And we'll likely see um, um, some consolidation, but, but improvement as we go out throughout the year. So that's kind of our thought, big picture. Um, I'll kind of break down a little bit here. So history would you know would would point to further gains. Uh, if you look at the table in front of you there, it shows the best quarters we've had since 1998. And that second column from the left shows about the quarterly gains of 15% or more, which there hasn't been that many. I think there's been nine since 1950. Um, and if you look at the column next to that, so the third column from the left, the next quarter, which would be currently the third quarter, tends to do pretty well. In fact, it's been positive every time. Um, since those nine times has happened and it's been the median return has been about nine percent same with the next six months so going into year end from called march i'm sorry from june 30th to december 30th um s p index again tends to be pretty well over this does pretty well over those next two quarters it's been positive every time with the, the lowest of 0.6 which is not a great return and uh, the, the best uh 21.3 but with the, the median about 15.2 so you know, we would think, although it's going to be volatile, I think between now and heading into the end of the year, we could see further gains in the markets. Um, uh, you know, I, I'll point it out because I, when I was looking at this data, I thought it was interesting. None of those quarters happened in an election year, so that that could be a, something that we, uh, you know, could show a different trend. And obviously, none of them ever happened during a pandemic. So there's always something out there, but history would tell you, bigger picture, you tend to see. Um, follow through when you have a pretty good quarter and uh, second quarter would would uh will qualify for one of the better ones um, you know, that being said we point this out every year 
third quarter tend to be the worst as far as seasonality goes on a seasonal basis. Uh, not not negative, just just um, one of the more muted returns. So uh, out of the four, it tends to be the worst as far as returns go. But you know, again, I think some of these it's not something we put a lot of a lot into, but it, um, a lot of people talk about seasonality, so I just wanted to point that out. Uh, I think our I think the focus likely is on 2022 earnings, and that seems like a long time away. But from a valuation standpoint, and I think it's from a market standpoint, that's kind of where they're looking for the market and or the economy to be back on their on its own footing. And then, uh, as we mentioned earlier, focus less on what stimulus is and more on the fundamentals. And I think that's that's what we're going to see. This is a chart from uh, Strategus Research. Um, they they have a little more uh, muted uh, expectations. Uh, they think we'll see 110 dollars in earnings this year, a consensus of 124. I had a colleague call me a couple of days ago or probably a week ago and asked me about earnings and I and I I used the term that you know for this year I don't think earnings matter and I know we're going through earnings season right now. So um, it might drive some volatility in the market, but a big picture I think we're looking out further. So if you look at the 2022 consensus is $186. That's well above 2019's which is 163, 165. Um, I think if expectations start to come down and that 186 gets down to you know lower and we don't see positive growth, I think you know that's going to be a bigger concern. I think we have a little bit of time ahead of us, but that's that's kind of what we're looking at. And I think you know as we look at the fundamentals, um, you know if that if that 2022 earnings start to fail and they look much weaker than expected, that that would be a bigger concern for us. Um, the, so we had a question uh, sent in to us prior to the uh, Web webinar about um, only a few stocks driving the market, and you know I think you hear that a lot on the uh, on the news media, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, uh, Facebook. I'll, I'll show a couple in a minute, but I'm not so sure I agree with that totally. Uh, to a certain extent, I, I understand the question, and I do think you know they are the biggest names. Three of them are over five percent of the index, so that is some that is some truth to that. But if you look. Uh, this is the number of stocks above their 50-day moving average. So 98% of the stocks in the S&P 500 uh, going back to early June were above their 50-day moving average, which means they had a positive trend, which means they're moving up. So you can't really get much more breath in the market as far as that's concerned. Um, it has come down to 65%, uh, so it's a little off the top. I guess the second thing I would, I would mention is that, you know, off the bottom, of March 23rd to end of the quarter, small caps did better than large caps. So small caps were actually leading the rally off the bottom. Um, we had pretty wide breadth. So I, I don't, I'm not too concerned that it's a, a small group of stocks. Uh, it's definitely the growth stocks over the value stocks or the cyclical over the defensive, but you always see those type of rotations in markets. So I'm not, I'm not too concerned about that. I, I do think we're gonna be stuck in that range I mentioned before for you know, a few weeks, maybe into, the, into uh, late summer, but uh, I, I still don't think uh, market breadth is that big of a concern. Um, won't spend too much time on this, but dollar looks like it's starting to roll over. Uh, why is that important? Well, it's usually pretty good for international equities, uh, the lower dollar. And you know, we, we obviously invest on a global on a global scale, so that's good for international equities. But but bigger picture, the S&P since 1988 has done about 11.5% uh, return versus 8.7. So 11.5 when the dollar is weakening, 8.5 seven when the dollars uh, strengthening. So uh, same with emerging markets and same with uh, developed international markets. They tend to do better when we're in a weaker, weaker dollar. So uh, a change in trend would be good for good for markets most likely. Um, and then finally, uh, I'll go into, into, into portfolios and where we're at and how we're positioning. And then I'll, I'll, I'll pause again for some questions. Um, so, this is our, our breakdown for our large cap model. Uh, they have 11 asset classes to your left there, including, well, 12, including cash. And then um, I put a C next to the ones that are cyclical and a D next to the ones that are defensive. Uh, so we definitely have a cyclical bias in our portfolios. We have for a while, uh, consumer discretionary materials, information technology, and, and industrial are the ones we're overweight the most. Um, utilities, we have no exposure to utilities. Uh, consumer staples and uh, consumer services we we have underweights too and then uh, the same as with energy so why is that important well if you look at leadership since the march low 
it's been pro-cyclical and the, the area's energy has been the best, which we, we are underweight, but the other following consumer discretionary materials, information technology, industrials, we're all overweight and uh, utilities and consumer staples, we've been underweight. So it's, it's benefited us quite a bit. Um, I think that'll probably, again, I'll, we'll see some um, um, backing up on the market here and there, but I still think uh, from a, uh, we still like our cyclical bias and we're, we're probably gonna hold that at least into the year end. Um, again, we favor growth over value. That's been a, a long-term trend of ours, uh, especially in the small mid cap area, we have a, a bias to us growth over value that's played out very well for us and as you can see with this chart um, although value had a little bit of a movement here when we had the uh, um, sell-off in uh, February March April it's definitely has reverted back in fact these last couple of days we've seen a little bit of a, a, a rally in, in value but we still think the long-term trend is, is secular and probably benefits growth um, over value um, and then the question we got a lot about the five the biggest names, which as you can see, I, I don't, um, you know, I don't have an answer for why, you know, if that's good or bad. I think it's a function of the market. If you look at those five names, they all tend to be disruptors in some fashion. Um, I think, you know, you want to own market leaders. We own all five of those. I don't foresee us changing those. We have a slight overweight to every one of them. It's benefited our portfolios. Uh, it's something we keep a close eye on. I will say this, and um, I would argue that you should talk to your advisor but you know if you if you uh, gift to charity and you gift that uh, stock you know it'd be a great time to uh gift i think it's up 65 percent or something that year to date um so something to keep in in, uh, in mind so i'm going to pause there emily okay i've got I'm, I'm getting lots of questions john so bear with me um okay uh, only give me the good one the, okay i'm gonna i will the easy i'll give you the softball ones all right that's uh, fine. <laughs> what is the outlook for REITs during uh, COVID? Okay. So um, I don't know if I can go backwards on this thing. I guess I can't. Okay. Um, I was going to go back to the one I showed about the uh, different sectors. So we're, we're slightly underweight real estate. I don't have a, I'm not too excited about real estate as, as a Ken Coleman could probably tell you, you know, as a, as a firm, we're reevaluating our office space and how much office space we need and who works from home and who doesn't work from home. And I think a lot of companies, a lot of big companies are doing the same. So there's gonna be some pressure, I think, on commercial real estate going forward, how that plays out longer term, I'm not really sure. Uh, I, I would rather let the dust settle a little bit on that area. Um, don't see us being overweight real estate anytime soon, uh, you know, most REITs, and, and there's there's different ones for every every flavor out there, own commercial real estate, um, they own office buildings, they own hotels. Uh, I don't know. I'm not planning on going to Vegas anytime soon. I'm not planning on uh, uh, traveling too much. So um, I guess my short-term answer would be, uh, I, I think we remain underweight. I think it's an area that's gonna come under pressure. Longer term, you know, we'll see how that plays out. I think it's gonna be a a bigger question on the secular trends of um, how people work and how they commute. And I, I think that's changing. I think it's changing probably much more rapidly than we thought. So, um, I, you know, I think they, they have a position in portfolios, but I, I would be cautious on them. Okay, we've got two more. One is more focused on the election. So I'll, I'll start All with right. the sector. sector um, uh, it looks like biotech will get us out of this pandemic and information technology will survive the depression. Are you more focused on these baskets or have they been overbought? So I think the tech question, um, you know, we're, we're overweight tech as I showed. I think we're overweight some of the bigger ones, which I just mentioned the five. Uh, I think that that continues, um, you know, bigger pictures they're just where all the growth is at i mean there's not a lot of companies growing at 15 or 20 percent and and those five companies continue to do that even though their their size is very large so um i like the innovation the disruptor uh, mentality of, of technology so i think you know there's certain areas that you want to try to avoid but i think bigger picture technology is a sector i think will, will continue to lead um there could always be pullbacks along the way and you could argue that the the nasdaq which is primarily tech is is a little over uh, overextended and there could be a, a correction there and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt that but I think bigger picture 
that's an area uh, we like and we continue to like. Um, you know, biotech, I think, is the same thing. There's, there's a couple of things going on with biotech. One, they're definitely in the spotlight because of, of uh, the, the vaccine and, and the rush to try to find a vaccine. It's interesting that, uh, you know, a lot of the ones that are out there that are really innovating or cutting edge tend to be the smaller ones, which really don't make a lot of money. It, they, they hope to get bought out by the bigger ones like the Gileads of the world or the Biogens or the Mercs. So um, I think that's an area that's probably been under underweighted and underowned for a long time. In fact, if you look at the technical analysis, which I'm most uh, average investors probably don't, uh, the, the sector's been breaking out. So I think uh, that's one of the areas we've actually been looking at. We own a couple. Um, we're we're about equally weighted in tech or in healthcare. We own one or two. Um, Ab AbbVie is probably the most likely uh, biotech holding we have. So it's something we've been looking at. But I wouldn't disagree that I think technology and, and biotech, you know, could be consistent leaders going forward. One more. Um, uh, do you feel like uh, the market has baked in a Democrat win in the election? So I'll touch that in a second. Should we move on? Sure. All right. So uh, presidential elections, we get a lot of questions on this. Um, you know, everybody has their own view on politics. And uh, so I try to steer or tread lightly on these things. But uh, so presidential election, uh, there's a lot of talk about the blue wave, which I think is what Emily was asking about the, the uh, Democratic sweep. Uh, this is from a little bit over a week ago on the 7th, I guess about a week ago, uh, the betting odds for a full Democratic sweep. Uh, as you can see, that steely blue lump number, 62% uh, of the of, the, of the, uh, the betting odds, and these things can move pretty quickly, was expecting a Democratic House and Senate. So that's that's the term I would call a blue sweep. Uh, it's, you know, 12% that the GOP would pick up the House. I think that's very unlikely. I think they can hold the Senate, perhaps. So that's the 33. So um, it's very unlikely that they will win the House and the Senate. Uh, we could see a split split Congress, but the, the, the betting money is going towards uh, the blue wave. So, uh, you know, what does that all mean, if it means anything? And, um, you know, I think the worst thing you can do is uh, invest your money on along polit political lines. So this shows you the breakdowns, and there's several of them out there that the one second from the left, I believe, is where we're at today, Republican Senate, Democratic House, and Re Republican President, it has tend to done, well, almost the best. Uh, 13.4%. The Democratic sweep scenario would be the Democratic Congress and Democratic president. So over, you know, over a course of time, and this goes back to 1933, it's done, you know, pretty well, but not as as well. So, um, you know, I don't know if that's really that important, um, but I, I think the markets are starting to look at that. I think the bigger issue there that will drive that is most likely tax policy. And probably less on on personal, and probably more on corporate taxes. I know Vice President Biden hasn't totally released his tax plan, but I think um, you know to to raise revenue, you have to raise taxes, uh, most likely high high earners, and then the um, corporate taxes. So we'll see how that plays out. But you know, bigger picture. Hey John, yes, John. Uh, yeah. Can we pause just a minute for a poll? Sure. Yeah. Annika. Who do you anticipate will win the 2020 election? People, a couple of minutes to respond. And that's who you think is going to win, not who do you want to win, right? That's correct. All right. Two different questions. Well, it looks like uh, it looks like people are uh, thinking that we're going for Biden this time. So, thank you. All right. So, uh, so the last, last, I got one or two more slides here, but you know, I think the, the more important thing is you want to stay invested, right? We we talk about it's time in the market, not timing the market. And as you can see here, this shows you if you were uh, going back to 1961, if you put $10,000 in, but you only invest during Republicans or you only invest during Democrats, 
you'd have you know okay returns but somewhat muted if you just stay invested it'd be much better off so the, the column to the right is the one you you want to be in um i make the joke all the time with my kids during elections you know uh we have elections on tuesdays and on wednesdays i get up and i go to work and i think you know for most people the market doesn't really you know the market doesn't care who's the president i think it's just more on policies and, and adjusting to the policies going forward so bigger picture i think you just want to stay invested uh, but you know as i mentioned earlier we talked a little bit about uh uh, the elections uh, a few minutes ago, uh, unemployment and recessions tend to kill presidencies. So if you'd asked me back in February, I, I would have, if we took that poll, my guess is most people would have thought the president would be reelected. Uh, it's hard to beat an incumbent when you have unemployment at all time low and, and uh, the economy growing at close to 3%. A lot has changed since then. We've had a recession in the second quarter. It's most likely over, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I guess if you can pull a Calvin Coolidge, uh, things will get better, but I think there's, there's an uphill battle there. Uh, but you know, again, we're we're in uncharted territory. We're, we've seen things that we probably most likely, or hopefully, won't see again. So, um, you know, I'm not sure what the voter psyche is like, but uh, history will tell you it's it's tough to be an incumbent running for re-election uh, with a with a recession at your back. So, um, I'm going to kick it back to you, Emily. A um, couple things to watch, but I don't know if you want to. Okay. There's any more questions. I have one more question related to the um, to the election, and that is that if you know, assuming that we have the, uh, that blue wave, um, is there anything that you'd recommend from uh, asset allocation adjustments ahead of that? Um, yeah. No, I don't. I mean, I, I'd have to think about that closer to the election. I'll be honest. To me, it seems like pretty far away. Um, I'm not dismissing a blue wave. I'm not advocating for a blue wave. I, I think you know if um, and I showed this highlight and I brought it with me, but I didn't put it in the slides. But you know, there was a highlight from September of 2016 talking about how uh, then Senator Clinton was going to win the state of Texas and there was going to be a blue wave. And that didn't turn out to happen. And that was only uh, two months before the election. So, um, you know, I'm not I'm not getting too far ahead of myself. I think as we get closer to Labor Day, that's when people really start to make their decisions. Uh, I think it'll, the election will tighten up. I, I, you know, if I was a betting person, I think Vice President Biden has the inside track on this, but, but a lot could happen. We're going to go through a couple debates. So uh, I wouldn't be making any decisions now. I think if we get closer to the election and it does look like um, that blue wave is coming, you know, there's probably some areas of the economy that, or markets you want to focus on. I think, you know, right now energy seems to be an area I wouldn't want to be involved. Uh, healthcare would probably would be a, a a long-term beneficiary. Um, so, I mean, I think we'll make those decisions closer, but as of now, I don't think there's anything I'd be too concerned about. But there, there will be okay. changes. And, you know, elections have consequences, as President Obama said, and, and policies will change, so. Okay, you're good to go forward. No more questions. All right, so, you know, what are we watching going forward? And I think, as I mentioned earlier, fundamentals are very important, but I think really we're, we're kind of stuck in this loop of, feedback from cases and uh, fatalities and all those things. So, you know, I, it's, there's no doubt that cases are climbing. We're, I don't know if you want to call this the second wave or is this continuation of the first wave. Um, you know, we can argue on why they're climbing. It could be part of the reopening. It could be part of the social unrest. It could be part of just summertime and people are vacationing and it's too nice to stay indoors and restaurants are open. I don't know, but it's something we're keeping a close eye on. But I think as it, this, the, the blue line there is a seven day moving average. So it's hard to dispute that we're seeing a, a, a sizable move up. I think what the markets tend to believe, uh, what we believe the markets are watching more is really the daily deaths or the fatality rates or the, or the percentage of cases that end in fatalities. Again, that has been consistently coming down um, and gives the seven day moving average that uh, I don't know, rust, rust color line. But we have started to see it pick up. So that's something we're keeping a close eye on. It's getting much more attention in the, in the press. Um, it, we'll, we'll see how it works out. I think it's something we're concerned about. I don't think we're going to see a, a second closing of the economy or a shutdown. I just don't think the one uh, states and local budgets and the federal budget for that matter could, could take it. Uh, I don't think people would be willing to do it. And I think we've adjusted enough where we're working from home or, or you know, doing takeout instead of restaurants that I think we'll find some middle ground as we move forward. Um, but I think, as I hear, you know, wearing masks is, is important. Um, 
social distance things we're trying to do here at Fairport. And uh, I'll, I'll end on my last slide. So this is a, a CNBC reporter on the need to wear a mask in New York City. So uh, as you can see, uh, she needs to be educated on how to wear a mask because obviously um, the people in CNBC don't know how to wear masks. So um, I'll leave it with that, but uh, I'll open up any questions you may have. I think we've took most of them, but if you have any more questions. Yeah. John, it looks like we've uh, we've addressed all the questions. If there are others, feel free to reach out to um, to your advisor or to um, the investment team directly. We're happy to happy to try to address anything we can. Um, this is a reminder about some other virtual events that we're doing our, in our wealth and wellness series. On the July 23rd, we have Maria Zeman, a health coach, discussing how nutrition can help prevent heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and even some types of cancer. On August 14th, we've got a workshop about factors to, con to consider when building your portfolio, hosted by my colleagues, Emily Shacklett and Katie Sheehan. And then finally, on September 10th, we've got a workshop about insurance and other risk mitigation strategies that are hosted by other colleagues, Dana Hastings and Michelle Taylor. We thank you for joining us today. It really is our privilege to inspire you and your families, and we feel a deep sense, sincere gratitude for your trust and loyalty. We hope you have a really wonderful day, everyone. <laughs>